do this. Of water on Uncharted 3. Um, this talk is about creating the flood effects in Uncharted 3. Um, Eben Cook, I work at Naughty Dog. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 11 years. Um, most of that has been at um, Electronic Arts working on Medal of Honor and then Naughty Dog working on the Uncharted series. And now I'm working on The Last of Us, our new game at Naughty Dog, uh, which looks really exciting. Um, let's see, uh, before all that, I studied graphic design um, with a minor in computer science at the U University of North Texas, and uh, that computer science minor is becoming more and more valuable uh, as a effects artist in games, um, and I think it's going to continue uh, in that direction for sure. So in Uncharted, we did lots of kinds of water. We did puddles, we did waterfalls oceans, and floods, which is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to give a shout out to the Naughty Dog engineers because they really do an amazing job at um, eking all the performance out of uh, the PS3 that's possible. And uh, we really couldn't get the, the level of visual quality that we get without their amazing work. So first shout out. And this is the effect we're going to be looking at today. With no. So as an artist, I look back on this, and I still just feel like there's something missing. It's kind of hard to put my finger on it, but oh, maybe it's Subway sandwich. Five dollar foot long. Um, so to make the effect, we started with a fluid sim. We did a pretty coarse fluid sim inside of Houdini. Uh, and we were able to iterate pretty quickly and um, use it as pre-visualization to work out timing and the flow and the amount of water and um, all of those details um, pretty rapidly uh, without having to go uh, back and forth into the game. Um, but it wasn't just for pre-visualization. We ended up using it um, throughout the whole production of the effect. Uh, we created the, the in-game mesh from the simulation. Um, we also used, you know, looked at the simulation um, for inspiration on uh, like where the particles should be spraying and uh, the direction and speed and all of that. Um, and then finally we, we used the actual sim data to push the rigid bodies, all the um, debris in the hallway, all the boxes and things, uh, those are pushed along by the actual sim data and since the mesh came from the sim data, the particles were inspired by the sim data and then the rigid bodies were pushed by it, it all kind of comes together and it matches. Um, so to create the mesh, um, we, had, uh, we had to figure out how we were going to do this because the surface obviously has to morph constantly. Um, we considered possibly doing a point cache, but uh, quickly rejected that idea because um, it would require a, a lot of new tech that we just didn't want to invest the time in, in building. Um, we did an, a first attempt, uh, which um, was more programmatic and parametric, 
in nature where it was allowing us to basically um, glide bumps across the surface. Uh, we abandoned that because it was very uh, hard to work with as an artist and uh, we just couldn't get the level of fidelity that we wanted. Um, and so we decided to go with the brute force method, which was essentially to do um, skeletal meshes, uh, because our engine supports skeletal meshes really well, um, and to do one joint per vertex. Um, the engineers actually were able to uh, increase our, vert our joint count to about 580 joints per mesh, um, which wasn't quite enough to get the entire flood, but uh, I'll, I'll cover that in a bit. Um, in order to optimize, uh, fortunately we had sort of a fixed camera angle. We knew that the camera was going to be tracking away from the flood itself looking back at it. And so instead of uh, using a, a mesh of squares, um, I elongated those. Um, so if you look at it top down, they're actually rectangles, uh, which allowed me to cut out about a third, or two thirds actually, um, of the the points and therefore the joints uh, that were going to be required. And when you're looking at it head on because of the way perspective kind of squishes it all, it looks like a uniformly covered mesh. So we used a ray casting method to, um, to uh, kind of extract a surface from the fluid sim. Uh, this was also done in Houdini. Um, but sort of the default um, way that you would do a ray cast is to just cast along the normals of the surface. And in this case, that would be just going completely vertically up. And uh, that was gonna cause some, some problems, some artifacts that we didn't like. Um, and so I experimented with casting the rays more in the direction of the camera. And uh, that actually solved a lot of our problems. Um, so you can see here with this diagram that um, casting rays along the normal uh, uh, in that striped area, that's, it's creating an error where um, there's meant to be an overhang, but there's actually just a wall. And the camera is looking you know, right at that, and it looks horrible. So changing the direction that we're casting from to face the camera a bit more it reduces the errors altogether because of the way the water is kind of shaped, but um, also the errors are more hidden from the camera. So that really helped the look. So, like I said before, um, uh, there were more than 580 points required for this hall flood, so had to actually like make three separate meshes um, that were all driven by their own skeletons. Um, and because uh, that gets a bit tedious to work with, um, I created a, a little tool that would allow us to um, uh, treat the entire surface as one thing, even though it's in the game, uh, according to the game data, it's actually three separate things. Um, and uh, it allows us to build it all as one thing, and it really cuts down on the iteration time. Uh, it's not as important on this one, because it was only three meshes, but we use this technique um, in other parts of the game, including like in some sand simulations with flowing sand, and uh, it became more valuable there because some of those surfaces were like 12 to 14 separate patches, uh, which would just be insane to, to iterate on if you're doing it all by hand. So here's what it looks like with just a surface and no shader on it. It's a little bit dark on this display, but you can see a little bit how it's morphing. So the surface shader, we use the um, sort of our standard water shader that we used uh, throughout the game and other types of water. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a really big shader and it has lots of features, but these are some of the relevant ones uh, for this effect. Um, uh, it does refraction, which basically takes a copy of the screen buffer <clears throat> and it distorts the UV lookup based on uh, the normal. So the normal will uh, change where it's gonna look at the, the screen texture. Uh, and then also the depth. So the deeper the water is, the further away from uh, the um, screen pixel that it would show without refraction, 
uh, the further from that it gets. So it gets more distorted the deeper it is. And then there's also um, opacity based on depth that helps it to look like um, there's particulate in the water. Uh, so where, where it's deeper, it gets more opaque. Um, and then for reflection, um, the surface changes so much, and it's, it's anything but a flat plane, so doing real-time reflections wasn't really an option. But the cube map uh, was totally adequate. So we did that with Fresnel to um, make it a stronger reflection on glancing angles, sort of standard reflection stuff. Um, and then uh, lastly, we did foam on the surface, um, which just kind of helps it look a bit more churned up. Here it is with the surface shader. So it lacks, it really lacks a lot of the visceral quality that it needed to have um, if you wanted the player to feel like uh, he's really being chased away by this giant deluge of water. So um, that actually came from the particles. Um, the particles ended up being just the, the real, um, the really important part of the effect. The surface was sort of secondary. Um, we ended up doing 31 separate emitters that were all uh, hand keyframe animated um, to match the animation of the water and uh, eight different particle definitions, so eight different types of particles that those emitters were emitting. So we have a, at Naughty Dog, we have a really uh, great tool set and uh, runtime to go along with it. Um, it's, our um, UI is all done through Maya, and we share a lot of the same features that um, Maya particles have. Um, one thing we can do that's really useful is create custom attributes so we can store off any kind of uh, da custom data that we want um, and we can, uh, we can give those data values uh, using expressions. Expressions are huge. If you're unfamiliar with expressions, you should get familiar with them and um, beg your programmers to uh, add it to your tool set because it's, it's super flexible. It allows you to, um, to manipulate data uh, pretty much any way you want. Um, our expressions are really similar to Maya's expressions. Uh, we can even piggyback off of Maya's like um, syntax error detection and all that. Um, so if you know Maya expressions, you pretty much know Naughty Dog expressions. And then we have the ability to use ramps, um, create gradients basically, and um, we can use our custom attributes as indices into the ramp, so we can pick where on the ramp we want to pull a, a color or a value um, using the custom attributes, and we can define those through expressions. So it all comes together and gives you a lot of power. And then we can also send these custom attributes to the shader, uh, which allows you to further um, control the way the effect looks by controlling shader attributes and stuff like that. Um, so it's all very powerful. And then one of the other cool features, I mean, there's a lot of them, but this is just one last one I wanted to mention is um, custom orientation. So our sprites don't necessarily have to face the camera, and they don't necessarily have to be velocity aligned. Uh, we can use our custom attributes and define vectors that will orient the particles any way we want. Super flexible. It's really nice. And all of this is due to Marshall Robin. Uh, he's um, pretty much the lone programmer at Naughty Dog who does all of the effects stuff. It's really incredible. He has a talk today at 2.30 in room 309. So go to that if you want to learn more about Uncharted Effects from a more programmery technical perspective. So um, as every game effects artist is aware, fill rate is the enemy number one. So we do, do a couple of things to um, get around the fill rate problem and allow us to draw a lot more particles, uh, which in this effect gives it the really full, like frothy look at the, the front of the wave. Uh, we render our particles to a quarter res buffer, so um, already we're drawing one quarter of the pixels, um, so that's a big gain. And then 
uh, with most of the effects that we do, they're roughly round shaped, um, and the corners of a quad are usually completely transparent. So we just chop them off and make octagons instead of quads. And it's a good trade off um, between number of points and uh, number of pixels drawn because pixel, we're, we're usually fill rate bound. So that's a, a really nice win as well. So um, the main particle that you notice in the effect is the froth particle. Uh, this, these are the color and alpha uh, maps used for the froth particle. Uh, they're based on source photography done by a colleague of mine at Naughty Dog named Icky Ikram. He's a great photographer. I love photos by Um And then to get more variation, uh, we, we had four um, different uh, looks in just the color and alpha, and then to get uh, more variety, we just um, smush around the UVs using this color texture map. And then the other main feature of the, the shader is um, sparkles. Before I added the sparkles, it really did look like flat, dry cards. Um, it still had a real um, a lively motion to it and stuff like that, but it didn't really feel like water. Um, but just adding little glints of light really helped a lot. And that was achieved with this, um, on the left, the uh, it's like a black field with sparse white dots. And then that's multiplied by a uniform noise that's scrolled across it, and it ends up just making it twinkle, basically. So um, the quarter res buffer um, buys us a lot um, back in terms of uh, fill rate, but um, it also is half or a quarter of the resolution, so it's, it makes things look a lot more fuzzy. So to combat that, um, I did custom mit maps. I took the um, alpha and the color texture into Photoshop and downsampled using nearest neighbor uh, filtering, which gives it a much better histogram. The the lower image, the lower standalone image is the uh, nearest neighbor sampled one, and the top one is, is uh, bilinear filtering. And uh, you can see that there's just higher contrast and a sharper image. Uh, so I recommend doing that if, you're, if you, your engine supports it. Um, this is what it looks like inside our previewer, our material previewer. Um, one thing to note is that the sparkles on this, the scale of them is not correct. That's because um, the scale is controlled by a user variable that's passed from the particle. So when I was showing you the particle UI and you had the ability to pass data to the shader, that's, this is one of the things that's affected by that. So when you run the effect in the game, the sparkles are uh, smaller, not so big and blobby. So Keith Garrett, um, he was the lead effects artist on Uncharted 3, and he's doing a talk that'll cover more of our um, uh, techniques and tricks uh, that we use for shaders if you're interested in that. So go hit that one up. So here it is with just particles. So particle lighting turned out to be really huge. Um, it really sits it into the environment and gives it depth and uh, the color variation that uh, makes it look much more realistic. Um, you can see it looks really flat without the particle lighting. First thing to know about the lighting is that it was a hack. Um, we didn't really have good lighting techniques for particles in Uncharted 3. We basically used a lot of hacks. Um, this hack was um, using two ramps. One ramp ran the length of the hall. Um, so the darker area at the top is sort of the back recessed area, and then the, the light spots are where there's um, light in the hall shining on it. And then one crossed the width of it, and the two are multiplied together. And it basically makes sort of a low-res looking texture. Uh, and that's projected down, straight down onto the particles. And the wonderful thing about this was that it was all done with existing tech. Uh, we didn't have to go to programmers and, and ask them to implement this kind of lighting, which is sort of a pseudo light map kind of technique. Um, just with the flexible tools that we already had, we were able to come up with this idea and implement it without any programmer support. So here's the 
final image with lit particles. And that's pretty much it. So, Naughty Dog is hiring uh, Candace Walker. I think she's going to be outside the room. You can check with her um, if uh, see if there's a spot for you. Uh, there's another shout out there. And then, of course, I wanted to thank all of you. Um, appreciate you coming. And I wanted to mention that there is um, a mobile evaluation. Uh, and check your spam filter in your email to make sure that you get that and fill it out. Um, and at this point, I can take a couple questions. There's a couple of mics. If you have questions, please step up to the mic. Hey, awesome, awesome talk. Um, the question you. I have is, um, Houdini's used a lot in film effects, a lot of game guys um, use proprietary engines. What sort of took you guys down that route? Did you hire someone who was a Houdini expert, or did you guys um, um, train in it? Uh, basically, between Uncharted 2 and Uncharted 3, uh, I started learning Houdini because I, I knew how flexible it was and, and how um, sort of a more technically minded artist can actually make really useful tools and stuff like that. So I started learning that and then put it to use in Uncharted 3. It was basically just my call. It was a little hard to convince them to, to shell out the money for it because it's really expensive, but we got over that hurdle. <laughs> Hi. Um, what was the uh, purpose for uh, taking the... Uh, oh, here, sorry. <laughs> uh, taking the fluid from Houdini into Maya, was that just uh, because of the pipeline that you guys had for uh, the joint placements and all that? Yeah, actually... Um, uh, it was a little unclear. I, I, we did the fluid sim in Houdini, and we actually created um, the mesh with the mesh animation inside of Houdini, brought that mesh over. We left the fluid sim in Houdini, brought the mesh over with its animation, and then that tool that I was showing that I created also like adds all the joints at all the points and sets it all up to be used in the game. Okay. Um, I will be outside to field more questions. Um, just wanted to mention that this will be in the GDC vault 